Good morning, everybody. I hope there's lots of people out there that are joining us. Um, this is the AXA Chair in Explainable AI for Healthcare. I'm very, very pleased to be hosting it. My name is Jane Wakefield. I'm a technology journalist at the BBC. And uh, like you, I've been working from home, like many of you, for the last four months. So having a webinar like this seems like second nature now. I'm hoping everything's going to work perfectly. We're going to be hearing from lots of people today and we're going to get some really interesting insights into AI. I'll explain a bit later on how you can take part because I want this to be as interactive an event as we can possibly make it and you will all be able to ask questions. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to say a very few quick words about AI. I've been um, working in this field now for several years and it feels as if we've come a long way from when I first started writing about it when it felt like AI was sort of coming out of the wilderness if you like and now it feels like it's perhaps been in some cases slightly overhyped but in other cases it's actually really starting to have an impact on our lives and there are very few people I think whose lives will not be touched by it in some form or other in a few years time. And I think it's really important that we have these kind of debates about what we want our AI to be like. Uh, we look at some of the ethical questions around it. I have to say that I've been very excited by what healthcare can do and the use of AI in healthcare, less excited by the use of AI to write stories, which obviously would mean I would be out of a job. So I'm not, not so keen on that but it's happening, it's out there, it's all real. Uh, and so without further ado, I would like to get this event started. And I'm gonna hand over to Claudio Janal, who is AXA's UK and Ireland's Chief Executive Officer for some opening remarks. Over to you, Claudio. Morning, Jane, and thank you for the introduction. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, in the launch of the AXA Research Fund Chair for Explainable AI in Healthcare. Thank you to the Computer um, Department of the Oxford University and to the AXA Research Fund for organizing this event. Um, now, I'm Claudio Ginal. I'm the AXA UK and Ireland CEO, and it's a pleasure to open this event in my capacity as a member of the advisory board of the AXA Research Fund. Now, as, as many of you, um, I absolutely think that uh, AI has a big role to play. And if I look at what we at AXA stand for, to make sure, to act in human, to make sure that humanity progresses uh, and to protect what matters most, um, it's clear that what matters most is the health, our health and the health of our families. So this topic is very dear to me. And as mentioned, as many of you, I believe this, um, uh, the, uh, that AI has a big role to play when it comes to the health base. And just let's forward quickly what it could be in the future. If you go to the GP, uh, and you don't only have to rely on his or her expertise, but you would know that this person has access to a big universe of data where all the treatments have been captured, while the reactions of different um, people to it and the treatment and outcomes, all of that would be in a place so that we can learn from it. Every time somebody else goes through the same pathway, we learn from it. How wonderful that would be to have a, an outcome with the GP where we still will rely on their expertise, but could also rely on them having the fact base and all the knowledge we have in healthcare to make sure we get the best outcome from every and each one. Now, we are probably just at the beginning of this, but if we look at this, uh, most of us have these variables already today. Uh, and this makes a big difference already, I think, for, to allow us to take care of our own health, to make sure we understand the, the pulse, the temperature, the steps we make. And this allows everyone to take some responsibility for the health of each and every one. And as actually we have one of the largest health insurers in the UK, I can see how this makes already a difference today. Even with what we have at our disposition today, we do see big improvements and there's much more and more to come. But it's fair to say that we just are scratching at the surface as, as, we, as we talk now. And there's a study that suggests that by 2030, more than 9 million health professionals will be missing around the globe. So we'll have a gap of 9 million 
GPs, nurses, and so on. And that's a huge gap that puts a big question around how we want to ensure good healthcare in the future around the globe. Now, for me, clearly, AI, technology, and data, they have a big role to play when it comes to it. And I think it will be on, on, two, uh, on two levels. The first one will be allowing healthcare systems to be more efficient, more effective, more precise, because they build on all the knowledge and expertise we have around the globe and can use the data in a good way, which will ultimately lead to more affordable healthcare solutions with better outcomes for all of us. But there's a second piece where I do believe this will make a difference, which is given everyone and each one of us more insights to our own health um, and how we, what we can do and should do to keep us healthy and when things deteriorate, what we can do in terms of steps to, to get back and be healthy. And both these elements together, stronger healthcare systems supported by um, analytics and insights, as well as individual, individuals having more and better information on their own health will make a big difference. It will definitely contribute to close this gap that is absolutely coming our way. Now, as with any new technology, um, there are, as Jim alluded to, societal, ethical, moral questions that come with it. And, and that's why we, as the Axe Research Fund, are very pleased to work with Michael and his team, because they are working at the leading edge of the technology. But they also have a very diverse team that allows that to come together and very good global collaboration. All elements that are critical in this topic. Now, as you might know, the AXA Research Fund has been founded in 2007. And since then, we have um, supported more than 650 projects. And I'm very pleased that one of the lightest ones we have agreed to is with Professor Thomas Lukovich um, on explainable AI in healthcare. And I'm really looking forward to his uh, views and explanations on the, all the territory he wants to explore um, and how we get there. Now I would like to stop here and then over to uh, Professor Michael Woolbridge, who is the head of the Computer Science Department of Oxford University for um, some more insights. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Claudia. Uh, first, uh, everybody, uh, on behalf of the University of Oxford, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's webinar. Uh, it's, uh, as Jane said at the beginning, uh, it always feels a, a slightly strange thing in the, the new age to, to do these, but it's becoming increasingly normal, and the truth is it works. Um, so uh, I'm very excited uh, uh, to, uh, to, to join with you this morning. So the first thing I'd like to say is a big thank you to AXA. Um, I, it's a wonderful thing that AXA did when they set up this research fund, uh, and we're already beginning to see the international scientific community, we're beginning to see uh, the outputs of, of that research. Uh, and it's, it's amazing that a company was so far-sighted uh, that they, they were able to see the value of investing in scientists in this way. So I really think this is a wonderful model and it would be a great model for more companies to, uh, to follow. So we're very proud that you chose the University of Oxford uh, for this particular project. Um, so let me say a little bit about the project itself, and then I'll just say something about Thomas, who's going to talk obviously in a lot more detail. So, so as well as being the head of computer science at Oxford, I'm an AI researcher, uh, and it's all I've ever done for 30 years. That's all I've ever done. And, and my standard joke is that for most of that time, it was a nice, quiet existence. Nobody bothered me, and uh, I didn't bother anybody else. And then something crazy started to, uh, to happen around about five or six years ago. And what happened around about five or six years ago is that AI started to produce results in a way that we hadn't envisaged within the next couple of decades. And the core of those new results were some new techniques in machine learning called deep learning. And the really fascinating thing about those results is that they came from a thread of work which has been in AI right from the very beginning. And it's about modeling the brain modeling the low-level structures that appear in the brain. And we develop the techniques, the algorithms, uh, to be able to build those, uh, those, those structures. And we were able to deploy them on problems which felt like they were out of reach. Problems like automated translation, problems like driverless cars, problems like facial recognition, which has lots of scary applications, but lots of tremendously useful ones as well. But there is another tradition just as old within AI, and that's the tradition of reasoning and logic and symbols 
and language. And one of the defining problems for AI right now, one of the defining problems is how do those two traditions in AI come together? And now we turn to Thomas. Thomas, I think it's fair to say, has his uh, research, uh, research experience primarily up until a few years ago, mostly in the language, the logic, the symbol tradition of AI. But he was one of the first scientists to seriously start to think about how to connect the old AI with the new AI and how to bring those together. Uh, and he's made tremendous progress in that respect and already done some wonderful work. And what I think the AXA chair is going to enable him to do is to really become the leader in that area, to bring these two worlds, which I strongly believe, and I think most AI researchers of my experience really believe, must somehow be brought together. He's going to bring them together, and he's going to do that through the medium of this project on explainable AI in healthcare. And Claudio, I absolutely agree with everything you said. This, for me, is the most exciting single application area of AI in healthcare. I think over the next few decades, that's where we're going to see the biggest, the most dramatic advances with real opportunity for social benefit, not just localized, but global social benefit. So that's what this, that's what we're looking at this morning. And I'm really looking forward to hearing firstly from Thomas about what he's planning to do and then to hear from the panel speakers. So without any further ado, Thomas, uh, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudio, for <clears throat> the introduction and Mike as well. Uh, that is uh, a perfect introduction for what is uh, to come in the slides uh, and, and uh, the project. Thanks to AXA uh, for the funding. Uh, then uh, to scan for GPU computing support and uh, for uh, Alta and the AXA team for preparing and organizing uh, this webinar. Uh, this uh, research is about explainable AI for healthcare. And my first question about um, this, uh, preparing these slides was, how do I transmit actually the excitement? Uh, that was also inside um, uh, Mike's introduction uh, of this area. Uh, so Mike has already mentioned it. Um, we actually have a revolution here in AI. Um, deep learning um, has brought uh, some uh, revolutionary progress. So what is deep learning about? It's about uh, learning deep neural networks um, from large amounts of data, mainly uh, in a supervised way. So it's about learning structures like that, that are inspired by the neurons and the neuronal uh, structure of, of the brain. Um, and we have a number of um, uh, impressive results, uh, uh, for example, computer vision, uh, detecting um, uh, objects on images, um, detecting um, skin or lung cancer, speech recognition and generation, so speech to text, text oops, to speech, um, game playing, Everybody has heard about uh, the Atari, the success in the Atari computer games uh, of uh, the Chinese game of Go, uh, then um, chess playing. Um, we've seen self-driving vehicles. Uh, and there is also, especially recently, a lot of progress in language-related tasks, um, machine translation, language modeling, and already time, sometime we already have uh, a personal uh, digital assistant. Uh, so yeah, so how, how do I transmit this excitement? Uh, well, it's, there is a huge gold rush in the technology industry. So there are a lot of new startups in AI. So that's one sign of this excitement. And also the big tech companies are investing a lot of money in, in the area. So here there are um, in, in this slide, top AI uh, startups and companies. And we also see here uh, a, a big portion of them. Uh, many of them are actually on healthcare. So uh, since uh, in the recent months, uh, we were looking at um, uh, a lot of um, 
uh, uh, drawings like this, I also wanted to bring uh, some, uh, but maybe with a more positive meaning. Uh, so that is here the private investment into AI, uh, which has been going up steadily up in the recent years. Uh, and it, it's not only uh, companies and governments investing into AI, uh, the whole area scientists, um, so academic and, and corporate scientists uh, are also very excited and that is visible in um, the number of publications um, uh, that are produced in the field of AI in proportion to the number of all uh, publications. Um, and yeah, so um, some other examples um, that uh, show the progress are the milestones where we reach, uh, reached uh, human level performance in AI. Uh, so maybe everything started not that much about deep learning, but uh, uh, the, this new uh, interest in, into AI uh, with IBM uh, Watson, uh, the, the system that won uh, Jeopardy in, in the US. Uh, then a bit later, um, DeepMind was able to reach human level performance on playing Atari games. That was uh, a nature article and actually the article that uh, started my interest in, into the field of, of using, uh, well, that was basically re uh, more reinforcement learning, uh, uh, the, um, that article about, uh, but already starting the area of deep learning. Um, 2016, then we have um, uh, superhuman uh, level of performance on detecting objects in images. Um, so the object classification problem in ImageNet. Uh, later on, um, 2016, the um, uh, DeepMind's uh, AlphaGo system uh, was able to uh, compete and win against, uh, well, first, uh, uh, European and then the world's um, biggest Go players. Uh, later on, they even improved this system by AlphaGo Zero, uh, which was also able to, uh, a version of it, to learn chess in few hours, they said. Uh, so here, maybe an example, uh, the object classification problem. So we have a number of images and um, uh, the task is to detect the objects on these images. So for example, this here is a container chip, uh, ship. Uh, well, that's a mushroom. Uh, and uh, superhuman performance was reached uh, 2016 in the large scale vision recognition challenge. Uh, yeah, then some more recent uh, achievements and here it's starting to move into healthcare. Um, so 2017, um, a system was developed that was able to detect uh, a skin cancer on uh, the level of human experts in the field. Uh, 2017 and 2018, some other achievements. Uh, the systems are able to um, recognize speech uh, nearly on the level of humans. Uh, in 2018, uh, it was announced at that time uh, that um, uh, a system by Microsoft was able to translate in, uh, on a human level way, um, in a human level way, Chinese news stories into English. Uh, so yeah, let's have a look at the skin cancer detection uh, so uh, there are actually research, research prototypes now that are better than human experts. And you, there are already uh, apps that you can download to your smartphone and where that you can use uh, to detect uh, changes of your skin, whether uh, they are skin cancer or not. Uh, so it is not uh, yet recommended to, to really do that um, without any uh, expert advice. Uh, but these systems are getting better and better, and um, uh, they are already turning into the smartphone apps. Uh, so here, a number of other 
uh, recent uh, milestones reached um, uh, and we see that many of them are already in healthcare. Uh, 2018 uh, prostate cancer grading um, better than human experts. Uh, then uh, also 2018 um, to predict the 3D structure of proteins um, and 2019 to detect diabetic sicknesses uh, in, in the eye. So let's maybe move to one of those applications, uh, skin cancer detection. Uh, okay, so here we see we have reached a lot of milestones in the area. So are we there yet? Uh, is that uh, fully usable in healthcare already? Where are the problems? Uh, what is still missing? Uh, okay, so if we have a skin cancer detection up uh, on our smartphone, we make a photo of um, a portion of the skin that looks suspicious, and then the system tells us low risk. So yes, is it actually trustable? How accurate is the outcome? Uh, does the system actually know that it doesn't know certain things? Um, yeah, so what is the app's confidence in this result? Uh, then, yeah, we may wonder, uh, well, maybe the system picked up on some reflection on the skin rather than on the dot here on the spot. So how did the app actually arrive at this outcome? Um, then another question that might be, well, I. I have a darker or lighter skin, uh, does the app still work or was it trained uh, with the opposite skin color? Uh, so yeah, there are several aspects here that are still missing. Uh, so neural networks are extremely powerful, uh, but they're black boxes. So they are turning an input into an output and we don't really, uh, are not really able to explain how, how they work. Uh, so their first attempts to uh, towards explanations, uh, if we look at object detection and computer vision, uh, so we want to detect, for example, objects here in, in that image that may be an electric guitar. Uh, so that's what the system then is spotting to when it detects, when it outputs electric guitar uh, or acoustic guitar uh, then uh, this was the relevant part. Or Labrador, then it's pointing to uh, the face of the dog here. Uh, so there are heat maps that can um, emphasize the part of the input that was relevant for a decision. This, but this doesn't yet say uh, that the output is calculated in, in, the cor in a correct way. In a similar way, if we want to make a diagnosis from a, a structured data from the symptoms that a patient has, um, yeah, then we may just uh, return uh, the symptoms that uh, were relevant for the decision. So for example, um, uh, the diagnosis is flu and the system may return, well, that patient had sn was sneezing, had a headache, but had no fatigue. Uh, so that that was uh, that could be returned as explanation. Also here, it's not yet guaranteed uh, that um, the the data that is shown um, is used in a correct way to calculate the outcome. So that's about explaining. Uh, we would like um, this back box of the neural networks to be explained uh, so that we know that the output is calculated in the correct way from the input. Uh, then uh, there's another problem, um, in particular in object recognition, uh, and that is robustness. So here there is a very uh, common, uh, well-known example. Uh, so uh, here we have a system that is recognizing panda on this image uh, with 57.7% confidence, uh, but then one may add some random noise and then uh, the system is recognizing on the same image for us. So for us, there is no difference for us humans uh, adding this noise. Um, the system may um, return with 99% confidence that this is a given. 
uh, but actually Gibbons look quite differently. So we certainly don't want uh, healthcare systems to make these mistakes that are very obvious to us, uh, but uh, to them, it, it may simply happen. Uh, so we want those systems to be robust. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so how, how do we, uh, what do I want to do and how do I want to reach um, to, to fill uh, the deficiencies of current AI systems? Um, and so the idea of this project is to combine deep learning with more traditional AI systems, in particular, uh, logic-based knowledge representation and reasoning. Uh, that is to tackle the missing capability to explain and to interpret uh, the produced results, uh, to uh, take away um, the biasness, so to get fair systems, to recover robustness. Uh, and uh, another problem that we I also want to solve with that is uh, that maybe with additional uh, logic-based specification and domain knowledge, uh, I can do the learning with smaller amounts of data. So currently we need huge amount of data and mostly uh, manually annotated data, which uh, where a lot of labor uh, work goes inside and with some additional logical specifications, uh, I hope uh, that less data uh, will be needed. And if we look back, actually, there are many existing success stories that are also already combinations of deep learning with traditional AI techniques. Uh, so, yeah, logic-based knowledge representation and reasoning, what is that actually? Uh, so maybe I give some uh, small examples um, uh, to uh, give an impression of what that might be. Um, so knowledge graphs. Uh, yeah, what is that? Um, so these are uh, graphs um, where uh, the nodes of the graph uh, are objects and the uh, edges between the graphs are the relationships between the objects. And that's a way to store information, to store knowledge about these objects. Um, so these are currently the standard formats, uh, how to um, represent knowledge that we extract, for example, from text. Uh, so every company that I was talking to is extracting knowledge graphs from text to represent the information um, that is inside the text. Also, if you think about um, uh, conversational uh, chat agents, chatbots, uh, many of them are based on knowledge graphs. Uh, then so knowledge graphs are a very simple formalism, actually much simpler still than uh, relational databases. Um, yeah, so you, we only have at most binary relations here. Um, then getting a bit more complex, uh, thinking about, uh, well, relational databases and interfaces, query interfaces to relational databases. Another formalism is uh, data log on uh, relational databases. So where you define, where one uses rules to define an interface to um, a database. Uh, so for example, here we have a database where the employees uh, stored, uh, then we may use a number of, of rules to define uh, uh, person relations, to define um, from the reports to relation, the manager's relation. And in the end, we uh, may, uh, on, on the derived uh, facts that we have here, uh, we may ask queries. So this here is a mathematical formulation of SQL queries that we ask on the relational database. So these are two types of formalisms, knowledge graphs, very simple formalisms and uh, data log on relational databases that are logic-based formalisms. And such formalisms I want to use and combine with deep learning. Uh, so what do we get um, from the different components? Uh, so uh, the new systems are then called neural symbolic AI systems. And from logic-based AI systems, 
well, we get interpretability. Uh, yeah, we are using a formal language that is referring um, to certain aspects of the system and through that we're already get getting interpretability. Uh, the system has uh, a clearly defined semantics. So if we think of uh, querying a database, uh, the answer is correct or wrong. Uh, we clearly know how the answer should be calculated. Uh, then we even know uh, what components were necessary for the answer. So we can give the facts and the rules that we have used to calculate a certain answer as explanation. And then uh, th we can use logic-based domain knowledge, a logical description of the domain uh, to add knowledge and so to reduce the number of um, data points that we need for the learning process. Furthermore, we can also use uh, logic-based domain knowledge to act as hard constraints for neural networks. So to produce some safety guarantees. Okay, so these are the parts of logic-based AI system and what is coming from there. Then concerning deep learning, so what is actually uh, the part of deep learning that we need. Uh, well, what is most impressive of deep learning is that it connects to the environment. Uh, so we uh, can pr uh, process images, speech, uh, videos, text, uh, so, um, unstructured data sources uh, of different modalities. And that's what it's useful for, especially. Uh, plus, uh, we can also do reasoning actually. Uh, a reasoning that is more inconsistency and more noise tolerant. And yeah, so here I give somehow a, a very simple overview of uh, the system that I perceive here that I uh, want to build. Uh, so um, we have multimodal input uh, from uh, um, different data sources like images, videos, sensor data, texts. Uh, and well, that information should be stored in a way and then uh, processed. Um, so it is extracted with some deep learning uh, formalism. Uh, then it is stored uh, in a formalism that is um, still uh, taken from the deep learning context, namely in a vector space representation, but with respect to a symbolic knowledge base. Uh, and uh, on top of that symbolic knowledge base, we can perform question answering and analytics again uh, with a deep learning formalism. And uh, well, that's the way I obtain interpretability by using a symbolic formal language, explainability the same, and to some extent also fairness and robustness. And in particular in this project, I want to apply this to um, the healthcare domain to produce such systems, neural symbolic AI systems, uh, to produce better and less expensive diagnosis, to optimize and personalize the treatment of patients, uh, and also to prevent that, uh, diseases uh, by uh, collecting and using uh, live data from hum humans, uh, uh, for example, from uh, wear variables, and then uh, to predict um, uh, the lifestyle and potential risks of these people. So that uh, will then substantially reduce the costs of healthcare, uh, also improve its availability and reduce mortality, mortality and uh, morbidity. Uh, we can have a more accurate risk prediction, uh, well, both uh, concerning lifestyle and also treatments, uh, and we can also act to reduce our risk. And of course, uh, an important aspect is here, uh, the explainability. Uh, and as a side um, effect of explainability, side product, um, I also hope to improve the medical understanding of diseases and the treatments. Uh, so here in the following then I will give, I think my time is running out, uh, I will give a number of healthcare applications that I will be looking at. Uh, uh, they are uh, extended with the, in the course of the project uh, by uh, other applications as they come up. Uh, so uh, concerning improved diagnosis, for example, there is a collaboration um, with Jens Ritscher, 
uh, on the prediction of uh, molecular subtypes in colorectal cancer. Uh, and one question here in this context, uh, are there uh, any insights that we can gain uh, to improve our understanding of the prog uh, disease progression? Uh, then concerning optimized and personalized treatment, uh, there is a collaboration with uh, Boroslava Mihailova on uh, fluid disease risk modeling over time uh, to uh, better inform treatment decisions for individual, individual patients. Uh, then there is one collaboration with Fergus Gleason uh, on the optimized, uh, optimized treatment of lung cancer. So the question here is um, um, uh, there are uh, a number of, of medications for lung cancer and uh, not all always work. And it's only in um, uh, the course of, of the treatment, it becomes evident whether a certain medication works or not. Uh, and to detect that early uh, is good for the patient. And uh, it, it is also reducing the costs. Um, and uh, so this is one aspect, uh, aspect that we'll be looking into uh, by computer vision methods. Um, to from um, images of the lung to see whether a certain medication works or not. Uh, and then uh, concerning the prediction of health risks and from life data, the prevention of diseases uh, with Aiden Doherty, uh, there is a collaboration uh, on uh, detecting uh, lifestyle health behaviors um, from data produced from wearables and to also additionally combine that with genetic sensor and other sources of data uh, to better understand the health risks and to improve uh, the prediction of health risks uh, from uh, wearables. Uh, yes, so this is all that I wanted to say. I think my time has also run out. So I give back to you, Jane. So for this next part of the webinar, I would like to um, introduce you to my panel. We will be joined by Thomas on it and also Claudio Janal, who also spoke earlier. And joining those two will be Stephen Medcalf, who's an MP and chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, Dr. Alexander Finlayson from the University of Oxford, the Medical Science Division, welcome to you, Alexander. Hello. Uh, pro hello. Professor Blanca Rodriguez, from the, who is the Head of Computational Biology and Health Informatics at the University of Oxford. Hi, hello, everybody. Hello, Blanca. And Elan Raja, who's the founder and CEO of Scan Computers. Welcome, Elan. Morning. Um, and just a note to uh, the audience who I know are out there, I feel a little bit black boxed myself at the moment because I can't see any of you, but I know you're out there and we really want you to join in. So you might notice at the bottom of your screen a Q&A button. Please feel free at any point during this discussion or starting now on the back of Thomas's excellent presentation, start asking your questions and I will bring you in very shortly. But I'm gonna start the questions off myself and I'm going to come first of all to you, Thomas. And it occurred to me when I was listening and looking at some of your slides, it reminded me a little bit of um, a story I wrote about Google a few years ago uh, when they decided to reverse engineer how, their, um, how some of their, uh, one of their AI systems was producing pictures and understanding computer vision and being able to identify a dog as a dog. And the pictures that they, that they got when they reverse engineered this were terrifying quite frankly they were nightmarish images and it felt like it was in some ways the first insights into the AI brain so I'd really like you to tell us a little bit more not only about how we understand this black box of AI but also how we ever got to that stage where we are now having these systems out there doing things and we maybe don't entirely understand how they do them why are we at that sort of stage Thomas. Oh, uh, you're muted. <laughs> uh, okay. 
No, I'm I'm not muted. No, we can hear you. We can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Uh, so the question was, how, how did we arrive at this point? Yeah, I mean, I just it just fascinates me that we have got this technology out there that's starting to go out into the real world, and yet there's still an awful lot about how it makes its decisions that we don't really understand. And I'm, it's exciting that you're opening that black box. Tell us, um, I'd just like to know a little bit more about that as well as why we are now sort of doing it after the event, as it were. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, so neural networks were around, are around for quite a while, and it, it's only recently that um, people were able to actually train them uh, because there is enough data available, uh, there are the computing uh, capabilities available, and there's also the software available to do that. Uh, so the first instance was to get uh, neural network to, to learn something. So that, that was um, uh, the effort about uh, first. And uh, now uh, that uh, the community has shown that it is possible to also do quite impressive uh, tasks with such neural networks. Um, we are now looking into, well, how, how can we explain what is actually happening in there? Uh, and uh, the theory of neural networks is actually not really fully understood what's happening there. Uh, so um, there is still a lot of work to do. Um, and in particular, it is not really possible to look into uh, the neural networks and then to say, um, how certain outputs are calculated. So it's just a collection of neurons and weights that are describing the connections between the neurons at the present. Uh, and uh, um, so there are first attempts to explain uh, neural networks and that is uh, on the slides that I've explained. So somehow to show what is relevant on the input to produce a certain output that may be a heat map on the images uh, or that maybe uh, certain parts of the data um, that uh, was relevant uh, for producing a certain diagnosis. And at, at this point, it's not really possible also uh, to, to check, um, uh, to already produce um, uh, an explanation in a way that is really verifying uh, that an output is correct. So uh, just by showing the parts that are relevant, is not enough. So we, we should also make sure that the output is calculated in the right way. Um, people have started to look into that and um, they use simpler models, classical models, to describe the functionality uh, between the input and output. And here in this project, um, I want to add a symbolic layer um, to uh, refer to certain parts of the neural networks uh, in order to explain uh, and um, uh, describe uh, the functionality of the neural network. So that is the main idea here, yes. It seems as well that there, the other big thing that AI needs is data. And, and coming to you, Blanca, tell us a little bit about your work and how it's possible that the NHS, which is not particularly known <laughs> for uh, efficient record keeping, should, should I put it like that, or even being particularly um, high tech in some in some areas how on earth do we take data from from that huge uh healthcare depository and turn that into something that ai can make sense of yeah I, it, um, the first thing is to check my sound is okay but um, yes you sound perfect <laughs> okay thanks so um indeed so um ai needs data and deep learning approaches need very large amounts of data, uh, but not only data, data that are digitalized, that can be analyzed, and also data that are labeled by clinicians, where um, uh, clinicians, and not only one clinician, but a, a panel of clinicians have identified um, the disease condition, and that can be used for validation, because as Thomas was saying, that's a very important aspect of AI the validation. So um, there are, um, there is an increasing number of studies that are showing the use of AI and the potential of AI when large amounts of uh, patient data are analyzed. And uh, that, for example, includes papers that um, 
are reporting studies on uh, 50,000 patients. Um, and, and very often those are imaging data, as uh, Thomas was also talking about. Um, in the NHS, my experience is that we are um, behind compared to some of the hospitals in the US, and that's really delaying the progress we can have in, in terms of the impact that AI can have in, in, um, uh, in healthcare. Um, so it's, it's both the availability of data and data that have been analyzed and labeled by uh, panels of clinicians, so we can use them for validation. But an, another extremely important aspect is what Thomas is doing, really, and, and the uh, explanation on the outputs that are generated by deep learning algorithms is crucial because it, it's one of the reasons um, we will believe in those results if they are explained. So I think Thomas's, um, Thomas's work is, is crucial. Um, I, I will put a, an example uh, that is related to cardiology. Um, it's, for example, and, and it's not actually image related because AI is, is having a huge impact in the analysis of images, but there are tons of other data that need to be analyzed, that need to be gathered. For example, um, signals uh, uh, related to uh, the electrical activity of the heart. And one example um, is the analysis of heart rhythm uh, for classification. Um, so we can have that classification done, but if we don't know what are the features or that explain that classification, we might not really believe in the outputs of these AIs. So I think Thomas's work is crucial here. Yeah. And trust is a really important issue, and I'm getting lots yes. of questions coming in about that, which we will yes. come to very shortly. But first of all, I'd like to bring in Alexander. And actually, when we think about a person's lifestyle and what makes them healthy or not healthy, it's a lot more complex, isn't it, than just the data that you can glean from their experience with their healthcare provider. So how do we make sure that we're getting a whole picture of someone's health before we start asking AIs to analyze it? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jane. I think uh, that's a, a very good um, uh, question. Certainly, if I just think about my own experience as a general practitioner, I guess there's an extent to which every time I walk into the clinic room, I'm a black box in the clinic room. And, uh, you know, I got taught some stuff by books and by lecturers. I still fundamentally assimilate new information and make decisions based on some of that, some of which I probably have a slightly fuzzy logic model for and then held to account by the requirement to do training. I'm held to account by the outputs of my work. Um, and I might be held to account um, by my peers. Um, but, but when thinking about the information that goes to make uh, a diagnosis uh, or to guide a treatment plan, uh, you know, it, it's fairly well established that these things that we call the social determinants of health, i.e. where we live, where we work, how we play, it probably have a more significant role to play in an individual's health than uh, what the doctor or the healthcare system can often do for them. Um, but why I think that's relevant is if we then think about the information sets that are used to feed healthcare insight or healthcare intervention, um, it's probably the case that the derivative information that exists within the medical record is only a small representation of the information which is relevant to an individual's healthcare whether that's about the interventions we're making or the uh, insights that we're generating. Um, so I think that if, if it's true that it was necessary for governments to make interventions to make it possible for us to access information from medical record systems, uh, then, and it is also true that social determinants of health are important, and it is also true that the information pertaining to social determinants of health sit outside of the traditional medical record systems, uh, I, I think, and to some extent hope that, what we'll see is uh, a burgeoning in the openness of what might be quite currently commercially uh, or proprietary held information out in the world about how we move, how we search on the internet, how we interact with our friends uh, that might contribute to, uh, through various analyses and interventions, uh, a more holistic approach to improving an individual's health and well-being. And you mentioned their government, which seems a good point to bring in our MP on the panel, Stephen Medcalf. And we've touched on this in pretty much everything that everybody has said, is that you need trust in these systems. 
how do we persuade the public to trust in these systems? And also, it seems to me that with data now, we've reached a sort of almost agreement that we need to let people be in control of their own data and they have to give permission for their data to be used. And actually, in healthcare, we've seen a few incidences of that. I'm thinking of um, DeepMind and its collaboration with um, London hospitals, when perhaps that trust wasn't quite there. Uh, they used a lot of people's data, they wanted to do something very good with it, but the fact was they didn't really notify people before that their data was suddenly going to be used in this manner. So how do we deal with those two things, both trust in how people's data is used and trust that these AI systems are going to help in, in a positive way in terms of their healthcare? So thanks, Jane, and apologies that I uh, dropped out for a little while. You didn't even notice. <laughs> I missed some of the excellent contributions that I'm sure have been made, and I was certainly enjoying Thomas's uh, presentation. I think the answer to the question basically is we need a conversation. We need uh, a much wider conversation about what AI is and isn't, and all, what all the various terms mean. Um, part of the problem that I come across is that we tend to present AI to grab attention, we use you know, um, artificial human images, which is, you know, we're decades, if not centuries away from any kind of sentiment. I'm guilty of that, I have to say on some of my stories, hand up. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, the, the idea of sci-fi robots taking over the world is still the image we use to present AI, whereas the reality is it's much more uh, detailed, um, and in a way mundane in the tasks that it's undertaken. It's fantastically good at, at pattern recognition and then determining from those patterns a, an output. So I think we need to have that conversation with the, the public um, and as chair of the all party parliamentary group on AI, this is one of the key areas that we are looking at is public engagement with the, the topic rather than talking amongst ourselves, which is all very interesting. It's actually engaging with a public who don't really yet understand the potential, the vast potential uh, this technology has. With regards to the data itself, you, you talked about DeepMind and the collaboration uh, with the London Hospital, I think. So, yeah. Um, Mm. Yes, uh, data drives these systems, um, but again, people don't really necessarily understand the power of that data and how uh, different types of data can be presented. So you can anonymize data if you're using it to train a system uh, that doesn't need to know about you specifically, but needs a huge amount of data, or you can give permission for your data to be used specifically to help train a system to better diagnose uh, a potential future disease that you may have. Uh, the problem with that particular collaboration was again, uh, it, it got spun, I think, uh, and it basically went from, this is a really good thing, they might not have asked permission to use your data, but by using your data, we've come up with this fantastic health diagnostic uh, tool into Google's stolen all your data. Uh, and those sort of lurid headlines are not particularly helpful when trying to have a grown-up conversation about a world that is changing and developing rapidly around it that will be dependent on us understanding what we are giving permission for. I mean, I find it quite interesting that you download a new app for your smartphone um, and you will click through the uh, I agree to the server use terms and conditions without even reading the first line of it. Heaven only knows what you've given permission for, and yet when someone wants to use your data for definite good, like the National Health Service wanted to use data to uh, improve our health outcomes, uh, we, we're, we're terrified of, of giving permission to that and people withdrawing. So that's why I think the, the conversation the, the, is the, the key to this. And all of us are operating with a degree of restraint and not trying to grab attention by uh, overstating what the technology can do and also overstating uh, what someone might be able to do with your data and if we can have that conversation in some way and government obviously has a role in that but it's wider than just government uh, perhaps we can start um, improving the situation and I think one of the places that we could do that to start with would be through the national curriculum through schools and not necessarily teaching the coding and the programming although that that is an important part of it, but it's the understanding of what a technology can do as much as the actual technology itself. 
ultimately, though, do you think one of the fears, and Claudia, I'm going to come to you with this tricky question, one of the fears that people have is that we're going to get to the sort of stage where people's health um, life is mapped out for them in some way. And of course, whilst the insurance industry would be quite interested in seeing someone's health map, potentially, individuals might not want to share it. How realistic do you think that is? I mean, that's down the line, I realise that's not going to happen in the next few years. But is that a realistic fear? Is that a realistic probability? And how is the insurance industry going to deal with that, do you think? Well, I think it's a real issue. Um, I don't know how the insurance industry itself is going to uh, deal with that. But the idea that you can map out from your genetic code what you might have a, a, pre, um, a precondition towards mm. is a real ethical issue because it could start to mean that, yes, insurance companies may decide not to opt for health insurance or life insurance on that basis, but you could also end up with treatment being denied on the basis that there is a knowledge that it won't work, uh, or in the long term, it would be not the best use of a limited set of funds. And so the ethical conversation around that is, is very important. Um, someone once said, I don't know who it was, never ask a question you don't want to know the answer to. And that's always the danger with understanding uh, if you have a, you know, a propensity towards some uh, un yet unidentified health issue that might come down the line at some point in the future. We're very good as individuals at dealing with those crises when they arise. Knowing it's coming must be incredibly difficult as you know, there are some conditions that are hereditary and people know that they uh, may well suffer from uh, a particular uh, disease. So um, I, I think we have to tread carefully. We have to um, understand the ethics of what we're you know, doing. So it's again, it's about this uh, difference between data and anonymized data. I don't mind using my uh, genome to inform uh, a wider system. What I don't want to necessarily know is that someone is looking at in looking at that specifically with a view to assessing me personally in the same way that I potentially wouldn't want them to see how many biscuits and cakes I buy at the supermarket on the basis that uh, the, there could be a judgment made upon that. Probably a lot more in lockdown, I assume, like everybody else. <laughs> Claudio, I'm going to throw that. I'm going <laughs> to. I'm going to throw that question out to you. The same, the same question. Oh, thank you. I mean, it's a difficult one because I think, as Alexander also laid out, the um, your, your genes is just a part of the equation. I mean, we know that the behaviour and surroundings they, they, it changes how your genes express themselves in terms of the proteins they develop and so on. So it's not as straightforward as uh, decoding your genes and then we know what is going to happen. So. I think it will always be a much more complicated answer to that one. Uh, but I, I think to take up the, the real question behind this is to me is, is also going back to what Stephen said, we need to find rules and governance how to think about it because where I stand and I think with insurance is we have to look at the good, the good outcomes we can deliver by, by having proper engagement with the possibilities that AI gives us in the data. And I'm absolutely convinced personally that we need to find ways as a society to talk about all the benefits it can, that we can derive a society independent of the individual society to solve some of the big things coming our way um, whilst respecting all the individuals. Um, but uh, what I don't think we should be drawn to is to not making this progress because we are afraid of one or two exceptions that then determine the whole piece. Uh, for where I stand, for an insurance point of view, but I think again, a society, there is much, much more good in here that can be done by using and sharing data in an appropriate way to allow scientists, as we have many here around the table, yeah, to do uh, all the, the work they can yeah, to get to better outcomes for everyone. So um, I think that that's what we should be trying to achieve. But it's also clear that the conversation that Stephen did mention between organizations, being the government, being the scientists, being that also businesses has to be a grown up one. And I do believe there is some rules need to be put in place uh, because as with everything, it can be misused. Um, but I, again, we should not take that as a reason not to, to chase what is, I think, is a great opportunity to just make a good, good advancement in terms of how, how we as humans live here. Elan, you had a point to make. Uh, very much so. Um, it's, it's, it's great to hear you know, the, the views of Stephen and what Claudio has just mentioned. And you know, it, the, the whole evolution has happened so quick, um, almost like a, a big bang moment with you know, the internet, with so many connected devices. 
each one of these devices is creating a trail of data and that data has become a new source of energy fuel and in many ways it's gathered transported transformed and consumed but in that process you know the, the way how i uh, kind of really assimilate and, and, and gravitate towards the comments that have just been made is that there are two life cycles that are almost coming together there's a kind of a, a commercial kind of enterprise life cycle in, in terms of regulation gdpr it and security legal finance business operations and with this new added model of data science what we do with that data that almost is interacting with the whole data process of capturing data, processing it, analyzing it, acting on it and responding on it. So we've got these two wheels kind of going around. And another really complex part of it is the, the, the vast evolution of, of te technology. It's changing at such a pace in terms of its ability to process that when you interact the two together and build these models, the part that was or is evolving at a fast pace is the ethics and the morals of how all these interactions of these various cycles are all kind of in, in, in interacting. And, you know, from, from listening to where Stephen was talking about government regulation, anonymized data, um, all of these things are set on a course which is happening, but it just needs constant e evaluation, constant tweaks, because the volume that's coming in at this time is so vast. There's a universe that's kind of evolving at this pace. And that's where there is a need of constant kind of regulation. It's, it's almost got to catch up to a point where the technology and data is, is exploding. And it's not just regulation, is it? I mean, I'm going to throw this open to everybody. It's this whole ethics. How do we uh, in, ensure that what we're doing is ethical? Now, the way that some companies have gone is they've set up their own ethics board. I'll refer again to DeepMind. They set up an ethics board, but then when the company was subsumed back into Google, the ethics board went by the way. Lots of other companies uh, talk about ethics and the need for it, but how do we kind of really get to grips with understanding that and also make sure that the public are involved in that sort of conversation around ethics? Who'd like to, to tackle that one? That's a difficult one in, in many ways. And it, when you look at it in terms of you, you, you take a look at social media to drive on that and you see how what was, you know, an app to communicate then became such a powerful medium that it influences elections. Uh, you know, we could see from recent events out in the US, the BLM movement, that how quickly something spread. But at that level, technology was, was doing its function, but its interaction and what people were doing could actually go out and, and, and you know influence in so many different areas which aren't necessarily predictable and there's, there's a whole issue about governance on that but how do you govern something that's you know uh, it's changing ever so fast and it comes back down to you know the, the role of government it also comes back down to the role of developers where when when a lot of these technologies are actually conceived and designed as, as thomas has given a great example it's done on 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 models on data sets that are designed by particular individuals and then tested out, you know, within the real world scenario. So it, it, it's an ever changing and, and a very difficult thing to almost want to capture and try to contain. And the, the bias will always remain. Yeah, and the bias is a real issue at the moment, isn't it? I mean, we've seen with our facial recognition systems recently that actually a lot of companies are saying we need to pause this because the data that these systems are using is inherently biased and it's therefore offering us results that it shouldn't be doing. This question is coming up in my list of questions, so I'm going to throw it out there to you now. What, you know, what, what can we do to ensure that the data that we are giving these um, AI systems is as neutral and unbiased as it can possibly be? Stephen. Thank you. I think the first thing we have to do is recognise that we as humans are also biased. So there is no such thing as perfection uh, in this area. That doesn't mean that we mustn't do all we can to remove bias from data sets, but you know, we're not perfect either. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things. One is that um, we need to have a, a, a wider discussion about data standards, about um, an understanding uh, where that data has come from. And maybe because of the nature of these systems, 
in the way that there is you know, some black box learning in the middle is actually what we need to do is find systems that uh, predict what the result should be of any given AI and then compare it with the outcome. Uh, to see then to go back to the data to see if the data is what is making the system uh, unpredictable um, because yeah, we can improve the data as we go forward but historic data is what it is and that's the that's the challenge also I just want to go back to this issue around um, ethics um, I think the problem with ethics is that it needs to be on an almost case-by-case -case basis and it depends so much depends on how critical the uh, decision or the AI is to individuals in our lives. You know, if it, am I overly concerned about the ethics of um, an AI able to play Atari games? Possibly not. Am I uh, concerned about the ethics of uh, being able to diagnose or predict uh, that I may suffer with a form of cancer? Is absolutely critical. And one of the suggestions that came out of the all-party group was. Um, to develop a British standard, so we're leading on this through the BSI, uh, to come up with a standard for both uh, how data is collected and used, but also a sort of an accreditation of AI, so that it is, um, it, it is designed and uh, taught to a certain set of standards. Um, again, this is work in progress, but it's sort of the, the areas that we're thinking about. Claudio. Jane, if I may, so I agree with what, what Stephen said. I, I think the only addition I would have is that uh, probably the way I, I would look at it is that we need to make sure that academia, businesses and government, we all work together because it's, it's not good at finding just one solution. I think we all need to work together to begin this transparency so that people can trust that, that we deal with this properly and with, with the right mindset. Um, the, because one of the things I also believe is one of the role of the individual and his or her own data. Uh, we, we could also think about that uh, as a responsibility to the larger society is to make some of the things available for the greater good, as we do with many other things. Yeah, that we have individual responsibility to share or contribute to society. Um, so sharing basically your own data might be a way also to make sure that in the greater good we get to better outcomes. But it requires, I think, as Stephen said, I would suggest standards or rules of engagement how we want to do this. Um, and probably, and I'm sorry for this, Stephen, I think it's not just the uh, UK. I, I do think it should be, if possible, Europe or, or on a much base, uh, bigger basis, because the more data we have, and I hope the colleagues who are scientists here would support me, the more we have, yeah, when it comes about skin cancer, the more data we have, the more better the, the, the systems get and the better outcomes are for everyone. Sorry, Alexander. I, sorry. Can I just say, um, on the, the, the standards, it's more that the... Yeah. BSI is leading a global project uh, because we have uh, you know, an established uh, history of being very good at finding the right balance of regulation. So yes, it's not just for the UK, it would certainly be on a Europe, if not global basis. Mm -hmm. Alexander. I, um, it was just, just reflecting, I think there are different levels of abstraction that we can sometimes talk about and then also certain concepts which can get conflated in the complexity of all of this you know we've heard about digital platforms we've heard about sort of digital interventions and we've heard about artificial intelligence you know could could facebook have transformed or caused tectonic shocks in the way that we voted without artificial intelligence based on a, a very highly scaled platform possibly i don't know um but those are you know digi digitization and artificial intelligence are not necessarily the same thing um, and then when we think about uh, artificial intelligence or digital, in contrast to a, a, a drug, I feel excited as a GP when I prescribe a medication, knowing that it's gone through NICE, it went through a process of being design locked, put into a randomized control trial, and proven to be as good or not as good as a placebo, and then you confidently prescribe that thing. I, I find conversations about artificial intelligence and digital interventions different in as much as those types of interventions are of very many different archetypes. They evolve across time and they can be heterogeneous in terms of having multiple inputs and multiple outputs. Um, so when we think about artificial intelligence in healthcare, I find it a difficult conversation to have because it's a bit like saying, it's a bit like talking about the role of chemistry in health. You know, chemistry is relevant to physiology, it's relevant to pathology, it's relevant to drug making. It's relevant to the effectiveness of the drugs whilst you're taking them through pharmacology. It's relevant to all of those things. 
and sometimes we're talking about artificial intelligence as a as employed in the supply chain of a pharma company sometimes we're talking about artificial intelligence as uh, applied to the diagnosis of, of patients um sometimes that diagnosis of a patient is through a doctor giving the diagnosis augmented by artificial intelligence um and it's sort of it, it takes on this ethic point it sort of takes me back to something one of the panelists said earlier about the representation of artificial intelligence as this uh, anthropomorphized phenomena of the, the human as an alternative in the form of a machine. And I think there are a very specific subset of questions about when it's no longer the doctor giving the diagnosis and it's no longer the doctor making sense of the information and prescribing the intervention and determining whether or not the intervention was any good. Um, but, but that's a very different set of uh, conversations to it, could artificial intelligence optimize operational components of the supply chain in the pharma company? So to conclude the point, I think uh, to enrich the conversation uh, around this stuff and to get to concrete answers, we need to look for the things which are abstract, which are, you know, in, in healthcare we've done with do no harm, maximize good justice, equality. Uh, people were mentioning their data and algorithms. But we also probably need to think more carefully about the heterogeneity of all of this and create an ontology of the types of interventions that we're talking about in order to hold them to account or else i fear we're trying to hold to account something that's infinitely complex that also is deployable in infinitely complicated ways oh. um, and i think a bit more granularity to the debate will help humans make more sense of uh, topic that's sort of proving too difficult, I think, for the world to wrap their arms around in some senses. Yeah, and that's actually a good point you make and ties in nicely with me throwing to some audience questions. And the first one is very much related to that. It comes from Tom Denwood. And he asks, how would you, he, he references some of your um, work, Thomas, explainable neural symbolic AI systems, vector space, representation, symbolic knowledge, how can a doctor explain that simply to a patient during a consultation? Do they need to? And how would they go about that? Thomas, I'll open to you. Uh, yes, of course. So in the end, we, we should uh, have something that uh, everybody can understand or is on the level of uh, the understanding of the people that are in contact with that system. Uh, so, um, uh, symbolic uh, knowledge or sentences are maybe too complex for doctors. Um, I think doctors should get natural language text uh, and, and then can use this text uh, explanations in natural language um, in order to first see the system right uh, and, and then uh, to use that information uh, to communicate uh, to, to the patient. Um, any other thoughts on how we make the end. Uh, go on any other thoughts uh, yes I, uh, I think that's it basically so in yeah. natural language i think you can already explain uh much better uh, than than with um, um uh, formulas uh, to the doctors and, and then maybe part of it uh, using the language of doctors um, uh, to, to communicate it to the patients. So throwing it out a bit wider, do you think that we need to let patients know that AI has been involved in their diagnosis or is it just going to become so in part, in, such an intrinsic part of the healthcare that it will be like saying, oh yes, we used an X-ray. Uh, machine for this, Alexander. Yeah, I, I mean, I I think there is quite good analogs in there. In as much as you know, I don't tend to say oh, a micro where it was used in a study three years ago to make this medicine that you therefore might benefit from. Mm. It, it, at medical school, it was useful to learn a little bit of the mechanics of how stuff works. But ultimately, sitting in the room with someone, I want to know like, does the thing work? Uh, what could go wrong with the thing? Uh, what do I do if that thing doesn't work and I need to do another thing? Um, uh, and I often say to patients, there was, I think there was a generation just before me who found that the, you, using the computer was seen as a very negative thing. You'd turn the computer away from the patient, whereas I now very boldly turn the computer to the patient. And if there's anything that looks like suspicion in their eyes, I always just say, you can basically have me or you can have me and the entire world's medical information. 
and we can work together. And they're like, oh no, that does sound better. Uh, and so I think, you know, as a patient, you want a kind of loose understanding of how something works and you want to understand what else you could have had and if other things could work better. I'm not sure the mechanics of the process of discovery are necessarily of that much interest. Where it becomes relevant, I guess, is uh, for me, is around the gold standard in the context of platforms. If these things were evolving re very rapidly in platforms, like, for example, Facebook equivalent, that therefore means the gold standard, which used to be the thing that NICE would evaluate against, might exist in 10 different states in 10 different platforms across the world. Mm -hmm. And I think where that evolvability is happening very quickly and the gold standard has changed, then from a patient's perspective, I wouldn't be able to assert to them that they were getting the gold standard because it's evolving and it's out in the wild. Mm -hmm. But once, once there is an intervention which is proven to be effective, uh, I think my principal desire is to know that it's good uh, and that it's not going to deteriorate and to know what to do to look out for in terms of side effects. Mm. I do know that when I went to visit a hospital in LA, um, I was told that actually patients were much keener to have the robot surgeon perform on them rather than the actual surgeon, which is probably quite deflating for the surgeon, but quite encouraging for, for robotics and roboticism. I actually think it's not, it's, I don't, I, funny enough, I don't find it deflating at all. I think it's like, it's brilliant. <laughs> it makes your job a bit easier. You just, you can look up the, the recipes on the internet. You don't have to remember it anymore. I, I'm going to ask another question from H. Wagner. And they ask, medical malpractice liability is a big issue in some jurisdictions. Even if AI becomes more accurate than the average human expert, what are the issues around liability for the errors that will still occur if eventually human and intervention in diagnosis is limited? And Claudio, I'm going to ask you to tackle that one. <laughs> yeah, so that's a very difficult one, Dee. Uh, but I think you, the question itself answered probably a, a, a big part of it. Um, as we discussed, many of the systems well trained, they perform at higher levels than any human can in terms of the precision, being that an operation or being that even and then how they analyze, for example, skin cancer, the well trained systems tend to have a, a better outcome than even experts uh, by themselves. Um, so I, I do think there is a piece, again, we need to keep that in, in the focus when we think about uh, well, how we want to advance with this one. Now, that errors will occur given the complexity of uh, just human, human life. Yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it is reality that we will have these cases. And I think there's another element we need to think through um, how we also, to some, to some extent, shield professionals to do their best yeah, with the best knowledge at their hands. Um, to allow to progress rather than being frightened yeah, to, to do things which again overall uh, mean that in 95% or more we have better outcomes and I think that's where uh, obviously that's how also insurance works that we always uh, socialize the risks yeah so we basically make sure that the overall piece works knowing that same thing with car yeah car insurance we ensure everyone um, and we don't expect that many of them will have a crash but for the ones that do have obviously we need to, to support so I, I would see that we again we make sure that the bigger outcome that helps society to move forward is kept in the focus whilst then also finding probably social things to socialize the the if you want the negative impacts if they're ready to come uh, so that we don't stop most of us pro uh, progressing in the right way Stephen um, thank you I, I yes yeah, so that was the one of the points I was really going to make was that um, liability that is a decision about where the liability lies that can be taken at the point of deployment. Who is responsible for uh, this technology? Is it the, the supplier Is it or the user? And is it the organization or the individual user? But once you've identified that, it's then just a question of insurance in the same way, liability insurance in the same way that you would currently. I'm sure Alexander has uh, liability insurance. Um, that then can be called upon when something goes wrong. When we were looking into um, one of the challenges originally oh. described about deployment of autonomous vehicles was where would who would be insured? Would it be the passenger, the vehicle, the technical supplier, uh, the software supplier? Ultimately, it's an insurance issue and the insurance industry will work out who they want to uh, place the liability upon and whom is going to pay the premium because we know that life goes wrong. Actually, humans are more fallible than um, 
machines in many ways. So as long as we've identified that, I think this is an issue that can be easily tackled um, and without necessarily creating a whole new set of problems. It's just a question of identifying who we want to hold the liability. We've got a few questions coming in asking about ethics. So I'm going to go back to that briefly. Um, no name given for this question, but the, the question is the American Medical Association Journal of Ethics posits that some AI technologies have tremendous capability to threaten patient preference, autonomy and safety. They are of the view that the current policy and ethical guidelines for AI technology are lagging behind the progress AI has made in the field of medicine. Do you agree and how do we address that? Let's go round the panel because I'm also conscious of the time that we're running quite slow. So let, we're running out of time. So let's start where we began with Thomas. This idea that ethical guidelines for AI are lagging behind the progress that's been made in the fields of medicine. Do you agree? And how do we address that? Uh, yes, I would agree. Uh, well, I think it's, it's currently being, being addressed, everybody is working on that. There's uh, a huge effort in, into uh, ethics aspects. Blanca, do you agree with the, with the statement and, and what can we do about it? Uh, I think one of the difficulties has been identified and it's the, the idea that ethics need to go with specific applications. And it's hard to anticipate all the applications and uh, in, in AI, in healthcare. Um, I think one of the key uh, aspects to consider um, in, in ethics, but also in assessing bias is to have a very wide representation of views. And one that hasn't been mentioned, I think, is, uh, is to have patient representatives in, um, in, in, in the analysis of, of the applications of potential um, potential problems, ethical problems. So patient representatives together with technologists, together with um, uh, clinicians, together with uh, insurers. And um, I think that's crucial. And the other aspect that I think can help and hasn't been mentioned also for uh, to anticipate ethical problems is the role of arts and humanities um, in, in um, anticipating situations uh, helping us exploring situations that could come from the use of novel technologies. And I think that also hasn't been mentioned, but potentially can be very beneficial um, for, for this field and for the ethical implications. Even if it is not totally uh, related, I think it's really, really important to help us um, uh, reach maturity in, um, in considerations around AI and, and healthcare. Elan, is one of the big problems here that ethics is a huge field. What even is ethics when we're talking about AI? I mean, how do you have an ethical algorithm? Very difficult because ultimately it's, it's a decision tree and that decision tree carries bias. But the, the thing with it is this, this constant evolution that, that's going to happen. As I explained before, the data is expanding at such a rate as is technology that it's going to be one of these scenarios where there's going to be constant change that's required. And I don't think it's going to be that there's a, there's a particular moment where there's always a right answer. It's going to be something that evolves as, 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 as things change. We see it in energy law, we see it in environmental law, these things that were not so prevalent you know, 50 years ago have now become center stage. And the same thing will be the ethics. But as long as it's clearly understood that there needs to be this ethical approach to it, and it evolves along with changes in data and technology, it's, it's the best that we can do. Anyone else got some closing thoughts? We are coming to the end of our time. Stephen. Thank you. I, I mean, I think it is um, by its very nature, ethics often plays catch up with rapidly evolving technology. And it's how do you uh, get in front of that? Um, I think organisations and governments particularly need to make sure that they have a, a good horizon scanning uh, process to look for technology to try and at least identify where challenges uh, may uh, arise. But as we move into a, a more AI enabled uh, or uh, world, perhaps we, the, where the regulation can come in is it would be incumbent on all organisations to have some form of code of conduct with regards to AI to you know, at least 
they agree to look for where ethic, ethics should apply to technology they use. And that is certainly would be the place uh, in um, the American healthcare system is uh, you know, set up uh, ethics boards, have a code of conduct when it comes to the application of AI. It will not be perfect because the technology changes rapidly, but at least then you've got a process that you go through with every deployment of technology to say, well, where is the ethical challenge in what we're doing? At least then someone's thought about it. Claudio, you're muted. That's going to become the phrase of, of 2020, I think, isn't it? Yeah, so, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. I just want to compliment on terms of what Stephen just said. Firstly, I think the work you do, Stephen, with the APVG is absolutely critical here to keep this at the right level. So, and I think this is a good this is a good uh, example how I think we can solve this here yeah, by having science, businesses, uh, and government talking together. How how we bring this forward and the idea of blank also to make sure that we bring in patients. I think is critical because what we need we need a little bit of trust between all of us that most of us here on this planet try to do good things to advance humankind. Yeah, and we should really keep that in the middle of what we try to achieve and not being distracted by the few who see it differently. And I really believe that's, that should be a driving force for many things we do do. And if you work well together with the right mindset and also what we try to achieve, I think many things can, 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 can lead to good outcomes. And on that extremely positive note, I think Sadly, we've reached the end. I apologise to those people who asked questions that we didn't get to. I want to thank my panel for joining in and answering those questions and really getting to grips with some of those really tricky issues. I just would like to say as sort of my closing thought is that the thing that always um, comes up whenever I talk to AI experts is this need to keep the human in the loop that, you know, it's not just about AI systems taking over, that it's always going to be a collaborative tool. I think in some ways that's an idealistic view from our technologists, but I think it's a very important one. And I'm very pleased that conversation is now open. Tech companies have been come under scrutiny, it seems to me, in the last few years in ways they never were before. And I don't think we'll ever roll back on that. I think that, that now the public government, society as a whole, wants to keep a very close eye on what things uh, these tech companies are rolling out and, and, and to some extent make sure that their role doesn't become too powerful. And I think the same will, will follow with, with AI technologies that we will always be very conscious of the debate and we will always have that conversation but we always also will want to keep the human involved. And I think it's incredible that we've gone through this entire webinar without mentioning um, the global pandemic. I can't say that um, I regret that we didn't mention that, but I also think that AI could really play a very vital role. I've been talking to some very interesting companies that are trying to solve the issues around it, come up with drugs and, and, and be able to do that much, much faster than humans. That's where AI really comes into its own. It can sc scrape through huge, tremendous amounts of, of data. And that's what we need at the moment is a timely solution to this health crisis. And if we manage to solve that one, if AI plays a role in that, then perhaps the next time we meet, it won't have to be in our own little black boxes. It will be in real life. Uh, and, and we will all appreciate human contact very much when, when, that day ha when that day comes. So I would just like to say to everybody that has joined in, thank you so much. Keep the conversation going. Just because the webinar ends doesn't mean the conversation needs to end. Uh, and I very much look forward to continuing to write about this subject for, for many years to come. And on that note, I will close the webinar. Thank you, everybody. Let's do the Zoom wave. <laughs>